Um, welcome, everyone. We've got a, a, a really exciting speaker tonight, Lee Doty. Now, uh, Lee is a PhD candidate uh, with a very interesting background because she has, she's a uh, history scholar, uh, but she's doing a PhD in the Department of Pharmacy. And so this, she's a very uh, exciting and interesting <laughs> individual because here she is doing a humanities PhD in the uh, School of Medicine. And I hope that really sets a precedent for doing more humanities uh, work in the uh, medical school. So it's really very exciting. So Lee uh, has done a BA honors in history uh, and she's now doing her PhD in the Department of Pharmacy and uh, she'll tell you about the topic of her PhD but her talk tonight is the right to refuse compulsory vaccination in the New Zealand Expeditionary Forces World War I. Thanks, Thank Lee. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. It is a pleasure to be here. My PhD topic is military medicines, the supply of medicines and pharmacy practice and the development of military pharmacy as a profession in the Anzac forces during World War I. As such, it's, though it's medical history, it also very much is pharmacy history. This is a, a subject that has never been developed. Nothing has been done about it, and it's totally invisible. So I'm quite excited about it. Oh, excuse me. So this, today's talk examines one facet of this. Um, it involved resistance to vaccination by members of New Zealand Expeditionary Force en route to Egypt in 1914, and the subsequent outcome of that resistance, because it has had long-lasting effects. Anti-vaccination or resistance to vaccination is a topical but highly contentious subject. Yet resistance to vaccination has, in various forms, been around since its inception in 1798. And just as a very large disclaimer, I am not an anti-vaxxer. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Yep. Although other vaccines had been developed, in late 19th century New Zealand and elsewhere, Vaccination for smallpox was compulsory. Now this um, polarised communities both glo globally and locally. While not all doctors approved of vaccination, mainstream medical and scientific authorities <laughs> considered those who refused vaccination as uneducated, over-emotional and hysterical cranks. They were seen as eccentrics and on the fringes of polite society. These same doctors and scientists, however, did not accept or take into account that vaccination resistance by the public is actually a nuanced, or was a nuanced and, and complex issue. There were valid social and technical concerns behind it. Vaccination was not a black and white issue. The administration of the smallpox vaccine in the early period was physically harsh. It involved cutting into the arm of the baby with a scalpel then direct transfer of lymph from blisters on the arm of another child who had been vaccinated eight years earlier. We're not talking about an aseptic procedure here. <laughs> there was a very real possibility of the child developing sepsis, blood poisoning or other infection, um, because they had an open wound. With unpaved streets covered in horse manure, tetanus was a very real possibility and a number of children did actually contract and die from tetanus. Not only physical illness, there was also the fear of moral degradation being transmitted. Who was this donor child and what sort of people were its parents? And that was very important to them in those days. Later in the 19th century, when vaccines moved away from direct arm-to-arm -arm transfer and were using calf lymph, there were quality issues with the vaccine itself production processes, storage, handling, efficacy. These were issues that were still being worked out. But another strong driver in the anti-vaccination movement was a high degree of government resist of resentment against government interference in the private lives of its citizens. 
In Britain, a number of punitive laws had been introduced during the 19th century, which impacted on the rights of the individual, such as the New Poor Law of 1834, which put um, unemployed paupers into the workhouses, and of course for women, the Contagious Diseases Acts of 1866 and 1869. The Contagious Diseases Acts allowed police to take any woman off the street, it didn't have to be a prostitute, any woman off the street and subject them to a forced physical examination for venereal disease. The perception of the public to those in the military who refuse vaccination will also be examined, as well as the role of the print media in shaping the public's attitude towards these men. And this is the background behind an incident that involved the part of the very first contingent to leave New Zealand for overseas service in World War I in October 1914, uh, with their refusal to submit to typhoid um, inoculation. This presentation examines this incident and the outcome from this refusal, as well as looking into the broader social aspects of vaccination refusal. So this is a wee case study now. While in transit to Egypt on troop transport Ruapehu in October 1914, members of the very first contingent of New Zealand soldiers to be sent to war in Europe were given the first round of what the medical officers were calling typhoid inoculation injections. On 25 October, during the interim 10-day period before the second round, Lance Corporal Jack Gilchrist died and was buried at sea. His official cause of death was food poisoning. The medical officer on board the ship, however, wrote a wee note on his file that he considered, as Gilchrist was the dispenser on board the troop ship, he was self-medicating with morphia to uh, mitigate the symptoms of food poisoning and he overdosed on morphine. But they put down food poisoning, it's fine. So although the injection did not contribute to his death, nevertheless rumours spread throughout the ship that the injection was to blame. Consequently, most of the 31 officers and 785 men of the Otago Mounted Rifles and the Otago Infantry Battalion on board the ship uh, then refused to submit to the second round of injections. They asserted they had not agreed to inoculation, but only vaccination as stated on the enlistment form. The perception of the difference between the processes of inoculation and vaccination are a key point in the refusal by the men of the Ruapehu. As a quick definition, at this time, inoculation was considered to be dangerous through the use of live virus, while vaccination was understood to be safe using either a substitute such as cowpox or killed virus or attenuated virus. The imprecise wording of the form created a quasi-legal problem for the New Zealand Defence Department, as although the terms inoculation and vaccination were used interchangeably and synonymously, only vaccination was included on the attestation form in late 1914. By the time the Rupehu had docked in Egypt, the remaining troops on board, with the exception of 35 stalwarts, had been persuaded to accept the second injection. The 35 who continued to refuse were returned directly to New Zealand and discharged immediately from the army. This mass refusal should be located against the background of the Vaccination Acts that were passed in New Zealand in 1863 and 1871, the development of the anti-vaccination movement in New Zealand and the conscientious objection clause that was added to the Public Health Act of 1900. This clause gave um, all New Zealand citizens the right to refuse vaccination. I love this, I love this cartoon, I really do. Resistance to vaccination began from its inception in 1798 with the fear of transmission of loathsome animal diseases and potentially fatal infections. Remember, there were no antibiotics until the 1940s, so any cut or wound could potentially lead to serious illness or death. And also in 1798 or thereabouts, people genuinely and truly believed they would turn into animals after the vaccination. And I can sort of understand that. 
as we know, the process attributed to Edward Jenner in 1798 used material from cowpox blisters rather than sm live smallpox virus to confer immunity against smallpox. Now, just a few words about smallpox and how horrific this disease was. This photograph is a patient suffering from smallpox in 1882. Sorry, 1886. There were two different strains, variola major and variola minor. One had a significantly less mortality rate than the other. Variola major had a mortality rate of between 30 to 50 percent and it could go as high as the mid 60s. If you survived, you could be horribly disfigured from the scarring and there was a relatively high probability that you could be blinded. The last known case of naturally occurring smallpox was a two-year-old girl in Bangladesh in 1977. After a very extensive and aggressive campaign, the World Health Organization, of course, declared smallpox officially eradicated in 1980. After Jenner, other vaccines were soon developed within the following 100 years, including vaccines for rabies, typhoid, cholera, and plague. Resistance to vaccination increased significantly after the passing of the 1853 Compulsory Vaccination Act in Britain. Smallpox vaccination was then mandatory for children and infants, incurring a fine of 20 shillings by parents who failed to have their child vaccinated. If they didn't pay the fine, their goods could be seized and sold also. The working classes of industrial Britain felt in particular were resistant to vaccination as they felt this law targeted, the, targeted them specifically. The um, health authorities considered them to be conduits of disease. Public perception linked vaccination with the very poorest of the poor, creating stigma and blurring boundaries between the social statuses of the unemployed socially outcast pauper with the hard-working but highly respectable working class. Not only were parents concerned by the physical harshness of the vaccine's administration, they were also concerned that their child would become infected with other diseases or that the wound itself would become infected, um, as I said before, leading to life-threatening or fatal consequences. Childhood as we understand it today is a relatively modern concept. It developed in the um, upper classes during around the mid-19th century. Until this point, children were considered an economic resource for the family. So the loss of a child and their potential earnings had real financial impact on a working or even lower middle class family. Syphilis was particularly feared and it could definitely be spread by this process of, of um, vaccine administration. In 1861 in Rivalta, Italy, 46 children were infected with syphilis from a vaccination chain that began with a syphilitic infant, and that was one of several occurrences. The anti-vaccination movement was most prevalent and most organised in the more heavily industrialised areas of Britain, which is somewhat ironic, as it was these areas which were also the most crowded, which also allowed smallpox to spread most easily. After much protest by the Leicester Anti-Vaccination League, the British government established a Royal Commission to investigate the vaccination issue in 1889. Their report released in 1896 recommended a change to the law to remove the compulsion aspect. This resulted in a conscientious objection clause being added to the existing law in 1898, giving parents the ability to opt out of vaccinating their children. And so it was, however, the act of compulsion of being forced to take an action against one's will with no right to refuse that created the strongest resistance to um, vaccination in Britain, certainly in the late 19th century. But what about New Zealand? Well, New Zealand passed its own Vaccination Act in 1863, and this required all infants up to six months of age to be vaccinated against smallpox. If your child was deemed medically unfit for the procedure, you got a two-month deferral. Failure to have your child vaccinated incurred a fine of 40 shillings, double that of Britain. As the combined male and female average weekly wage in 1873 for general labourers, tradesmen and house servants was 35 shillings, this penalty would have severe financial consequences for a working class family. The Act of 1863 was repealed in 1871 with a new Vaccination Act was passed, 
that removed compulsory infant vaccination but added the requirement for school children to be vaccinated, effectively pushing back the age for vaccination. The 1871 Act appointed public vaccinators by the government who had authority to remove children from school and vaccinate them without the parents' consent. Compulsory infant vaccination was, however, reinstated in the Public Health Act of 1872. You couldn't quite get away with it. Under the Vaccination Acts, and this is actually quite an important point, inoculation was defined as a process that used live smallpox virus rather than cowpox and as such was subject to significantly stiffer legal penalties. These included a fine of, up to, of £10 and up to a month in prison. Under the legal definition, inoculation related solely to smallpox. Using smallpox virus for inoculation risks spreading smallpox into the community if the inoculated person did not remain in isolation until the disease had run its course. Vaccination, on the other hand, did not spread contagion. You could not get cowpox or any of the other diseases that they had developed vaccines for from a vaccinated person. Vaccination used killed or attenuated virus or a substitute. Although New Zealand did have an anti-vaccination league, it does not appear to be as vocal or as organised as in Britain. The lack of enthusiasm for organised resistance may be due in part to the fact that up until 1913, New Zealand has never had a significant outbreak of smallpox, and so the general population had either forgotten about or was unfamiliar with the horrors of the disease. We have never had an outbreak of variola major. We have had variola minor. In 1913, our largest outbreak involved about 2,000 northern Māori, of which 55 died. This is not bad as in the mid-19th century in England, tens of thousands were dying from smallpox. So 55 not that bad, really. In, in, um, it was all relative. The president of New Zealand's League, an English dentist named Edwin Cox, wrote to the Waikato Independent after the repeal of Britain's, Britain's compulsion clause, making seven key statements as to why he felt vaccination was not efficacious. Two of these statements relate directly to the compulsion aspect of the Vaccination Acts, and he considered that, quote, compulsory vaccination is an outrage against sacred, sacred human rights, end quote. Following Britain's example, a conscientious objection clause was then added to the Public Health Act in 1900. New Zealanders were also then given the right to refuse vaccination. And so this is the background context behind the New Zealand Expeditionary Force inoculation rejection. In 19th century Britain, typhoid had the distinction of being the second greatest cause of death after tuberculosis. Its mortality rate was higher than cholera. And remember, Prince Albert died of typhoid. For the military authorities, typhoid was a particularly worrisome disease. It was responsible for two-thirds of the British death toll in the 1899-1902 Boer War. Approximately 13,000 were dead of the disease, compared to around 8,000 dead from battle. By 1914, vaccination methods had improved significantly, no longer requiring cutting into the flesh and direct arm-to-arm -arm transfer of lymph from blisters, but that used calf lymph and were now given by injection. The typhoid vaccination consisted of two injections 10 days apart, with a two-day recovery period after each injection, and they did need the full two days to recover. Injections were very painful and were administered either into the upper arm or into the top of the chest, around an inch and a half below the collarbone, so right into the pectoral muscle there. It would have been very painful. With well, a two-day recovery period, it was therefore essential that troops were vaccinated well before soldiers were in the middle of battle, and there was no time to spare for recovery. When the men of the Ruapehu refused the injection, they argued they had not agreed to inoculation, only vaccination, and technically they were correct. Defined by law, inoculation refused to, referred to the use of live pathogen, and specifically smallpox, in the process of immunisation as they would have been also aware of the significantly higher legal penalties attached to inoculation rather than vaccination, the troops rejected inoculation. Both medical and army personnel, however, regularly conflated the two terms, but from the soldier's point of view, 
Vaccination was all they had signed up for. This use of non-standard terminology created confusion within both the troops as well as all the way up the command chain. Compulsory vaccination was not, however, mandated in the military legislation at the time of the war's commencement. The attestation form, so when you join the army you attest, it's part of your enlisting process. The attestation form was effectively the employment agreement between the recruit and the government. Even after conscription was introduced in 1916, the attestation form was still required to be completed and signed. After the men of the Rupehu had argued that they had only agreed to vaccination as um, stated on the attestation form, recruiting staff and enlisting officers then began to handwrite and inoculate it on the form, requiring the recruit to initial the, to signify acceptance of the change. By early 1916, the words had been added to the next print run of forms and handwritten editions were no longer required. Agreement to both inoculation and vaccination and probably any other Asian was now official. By March 1917, however, all reference to either vaccination or inoculation had been removed. By this time, no formal signed assent was sought as the soldier was required under law to submit to the procedure without any right whatsoever to refuse. The military legislation in effect at the outbreak of the war was the Defence Act of 1909. This act focused specifically on the establishment of a system of compulsory military training, but it contained no reference to vaccination or inoculation. I have been through this looking and I, there is nothing there. It was, however, expected that the citizen militia who were not professional soldiers, were only partly trained with little military experience, would follow their superior officer's orders without question. This proved not to be the case in actuality. Certainly not at the start. They were not moulded soldiers. They were not professional soldiers at the start. Certainly they became so. Confusion over vaccination was evident from the start, with several reports of enlistees being told at the time of enlistment that vaccination or inoculation was purely optional. It is highly likely that much of the misunderstanding around the compulsory or otherwise nature of vaccination or inoculation may have arisen indirectly from the British military itself and the nature of New Zealand's relationship to the Imperial Government. Although a self-governing dominion of the British Empire by this stage, nevertheless New Zealand was still expected to take direction from the British Imperial Army on matters to do with the war. Vaccination in the BEF was voluntary. Soldiers had as much right as civilians to refuse vaccination. Also, the New Zealand Expeditionary Force was considered by much of New Zealand's public as being a unit of the British Expeditionary Force, and that consequently British Army regulations took precedence over local military directives. A letter was written to the Otago Daily Times by one D. Wishart on 12 June 1920 in support of the men who refused the typhoid injection. He con condemned the decision by the Returned Servicemen's Association that the refusers were ineligible for benefits under the Discharged Soldiers Se Settlement Act. His view was that those who refused vaccination should not be penalised as, quote, on the authority of Lord Kitchener, at the time the men refused vaccination, it was voluntary in the army, and our New Zealand troops were but a unit of the British Army of Occupation of Egypt. End quote. In the absence of a clear statement regarding either vaccination or inoculation in the Defence Act of 1909, not only were the troops confused, but so too were the NZEF commanders. As an example, on the 18th of August 1916, Lieutenant Colonel D. A. Chater, Commandant of the New Zealand Army <laughs> Force in Cairo, contacted Major General Sir John, I'm not sure about how to say this, I'm going to stick to one version, Adji, the D Deputy Adjutant General of General Headquarters, this is British, seeking advice regarding some men who were refusing cholera vaccinations. He inquired whether the men could be compelled to submit to vaccination or, if not, then request the authority to return them to New Zealand. His inquiry was passed up the chain of command to the War Office in London, who then replied that compulsion is not lawful. 
Addy then advised Chater that returning the men was not ideal, as it could encourage others to follow their example. On the 22nd of January 1915, the 35 men who refused the second typhoid injection from the Ruapehu arrived back in New Zealand um, on the Athenic, there she is, and they were promptly discharged from the New Zealand Army. Literally as soon as they took the first step onto New Zealand soil, they were considered no longer the Army's problem. Their arrival created a flurry of stories in the newspapers with a high level of media interest. A number of publications ran articles on the vaccination issue in the NZDF and the subsequent treatment of those who refused it. The Auckland Star reported that those who were returned were adamant that on enlistment they were advised that inoculation was optional or vaccination. They also said that they greatly objected to being sent back from Egypt for the sole reason that they had refused vaccination. There was no suggestion that the refusal to be vaccinated was due to a change of heart about serving and that their return was in fact a sore point with them, indicating that these men genuinely wanted to do their duty. Less than a week after their arrival, a letter was sent to the editor of the New Zealand Times from a member of the Samoan reinforcement contingent in camp at Trentham. We had already gone to Samoa and back again we secured the radio, German radio station in German Samoa at the time. <coughs> Excuse me. This letter advised that um, the Samoan contingent had also been told that inoculation or vaccination was optional and described the supposed effects of the typhoid vaccination on young, fit and healthy men that they were witnessing. They were depicted as reduced to lying on their beds, suffering agonies of pain and some were apparently so bad they had to be hospitalised. In the same way as medical officers, enlisting officers also conflated the terms inoculation and vaccination, and this also resulted in significant confusion. Many of the men returned, many of the men who were returned had previously served in the army and were keen to do so again. So their return to New Zealand, effectively in disgrace, was a definite sore point and they felt it keenly. One refuser was interviewed by the New Zealand Truth and stated that he and his fellows were treated very poorly and, he felt, childishly for standing up for their principles. Those that were refused were told that they were, quote, a damned lot of cowards, close quote, and they really felt this insult, this was keenly felt. General Sir Alexander Godley, the Commander-in-Chief of the New Zealand Forces, was well aware there was no legal method to compel the soldiers to undergo vaccination or inoculation. Prior to the men being returned, they were paraded before Godley and he attempted to persuade them again to have the vaccination. This is why they were persuaded they couldn't be ordered. He expressed his regret that around 150 men, including the New Zealanders who refused vaccination, um, Uh, were being paraded in front of him, but he also told them outright that he could not compel them. He advised the men that they were, quote, disobeying no orders whatsoever and were at perfect liberty to use their own discretion whether they were inoculated or not, end quote. Once the men arrived back in New Zealand and the newspapers had published several interviews and along with the letter from the Samoan contingent, Colonel J.R. Purdy, head of the New Zealand Army Medical Service, wrote letters to the editors of various newspapers refuting the claims. He advised that the men may have been lying on their beds, but no, they were not suffering agonies of pain, and stated that inoculation for typhoid was compulsory and that inoculation and vaccination were synonymous terms. Unfortunately, there was no legal way to compel them. Unfortunately, again, this did little to allay the general confusion around the compulsion aspect for military vaccination. Godley also wrote to publicly defend his actions, yet continued to contribute to the confusion by giving mixed messages over a period of several days. A strong message was published by Godley in the New Zealand Times on 27 January 1915, where he stated that the refusers had failed in their duty as soldiers. Three days later, a report written by Godley to the New Zealand Minister of Defence um, was published, and in this report he stated that he respected the men's conscientious objections, and although he did not wish in any way to threaten them, his first duty lay to the force as a whole, and he could not risk the health of the men, 
So on one hand, he was basically agreeing that they were a damn lot of cowards, and on the other hand, he was saying, well, actually, I respect the conscientious objections. He also stated that his reasons for returning the men was to enforce discipline and efficiency, as it would then make those who were, uh, remained in Egypt uh, realise that they had to conform to necessary orders. These mixed messages reported by the print media contributed to the general public's confusion as to what exactly was required from the soldiers on enlistment. So what did the general public think about the men who refused the vaccination? Were they cranks or were they shirkers trying to get out of doing their duty? As a result of the conf this confusion, public opinion remained divided on the issue and members of the public were quick to judge those who returned as shirkers. Unfortunately, this condemnation also included those who had been returned for genuine medical reasons. They had also been on the receiving end of, quote, much unpleasantness, close quote, and who resented having aspersions cast against them. Remember, there were only 35 who refused out of 150, so there were quite a number who were returned for medical uh, reasons, were quite genuine, and there were also some who returned because they were incorrigible. The New Zealand Truth the champion of the underdog, took the part of the refusers and an editorial published on 13 February 1915 took the public to task for vilifying those who stay true to their principles and refuse vaccination. The truth also laid the blame for shaping the public's perception against the refusers at the foot of their main rivals, the New Zealand Herald and the Auckland Star. The only evidence of a defamatory article, however, was published in the Herald on 3rd of February 1915, where they reported that the action of the officer commanding the Auckland district in summarily depriving men of their uniforms, those who had returned from Egypt, uh, would be heartily approved of by the um, general public. At no point did this article single out those who had refused vaccination, but considered all who had been returned and discharged for other than medical reasons as unfit to wear the khaki. The truth pointed the finger squarely at Colonel Jackie Hume for inciting public approbation. Hume was an artillery officer who had served in the Boer War and with whom Truth had a long-running dispute with from at least 1907 when the tabloid called for an inquiry into his fitness to command men. Although the Truth does exhibit a high degree of sympathy for the vaccination refusers and um, what they were going through, it does, however, appear that the men's circumstances were useful to the publication in its continued pursuit of Hume. Did the refusers change their minds about serving on the way to Egypt and use refusal to be inoculated as a way to get out of duty? Perhaps some, perhaps some did, but the majority of the 35 refusers who were, were actually experienced military, um, sorry, were experienced imperial soldiers. One who was sent back had seen 20 years service in the British Army and was decorated from campaigns in South Africa, Egypt and India. These men genuinely wanted to serve again, but they refused inoculation. Sapper Fred Holford, a 34-year-old telegraphist from Gisborne, excuse me, volunteered as soon as the war was declared. He had previously been vaccinated and agreed to vaccination as stated on the enlistment form. He enlisted, however, on the undertaking and advice from the enlisting officer that vaccination and inoculation were optional. As one of the 35 who was returned on the Athenic, Holford was discharged immediately on arrival in New Zealand. He then turned around and immediately obtained a berth on a ship and worked his passage to London. On arrival in Britain, he then joined the Royal Engineers and continued on active service with them throughout the war. He was sent to Gallipoli with the British forces and took part with the Royal Engineers in the evacuation of both Suvla Bay and Cape Halley's. After Gallipoli, he was sent to France and he served on the Western Front from the 1st of July 1915 until the end of the war. He was then repatriated back to New Zealand in 1919. Inoculation or vaccination was voluntary in the British Army and although Holford had been paraded three or four times for vaccination, he had refused it without any consequence or any prejudice and continued to serve, which is what he wanted to do. As an interesting aside, the majority of those who were returned on the Athenic who actually refused seemed to be older men, 
um, rather than the um, young ones who, who signed up in their droves. So these were more considered people who were fully aware of how painful the, small, uh, the smallpox administration ac um, vaccine actually was. Confusion over compulsion was not the only problem for the authorities. Quality and efficacy of the vaccine itself created a totally separate headache. Perceptions of poor quality vaccine may have also contributed to the refusal on the Ruapehu. Gilchrist had, after all, died. Does this mean the vaccine itself was dangerous? No, he had food po He did, did actually die from, from morphine overdose relating to food poisoning. In fact, the New Zealand issue typhoid vaccine did confer immunity against typhoid, but it did not work for paratyphoid, a different strain of salmonella, which was prevalent in Egypt, Gallipoli and Madras. Careless use of the generalised term enteric fever by the medical staff as a catch-all for any typhoid-like illness created both misunderstanding and in inaccurate reporting of the incidence of both typhoid and paratyphoid. This common term was used so indiscriminately as a descriptor of any typhoid-like fever that its use was forbidden by military order. Enteric was only permitted to be used if the disease could be proven through differential diagnosis in the laboratory to actually be paratyphoid, which is, was Salmonella enterica. Nevertheless, the New Zealand issued vaccine was considered to be weak with no virulence. A report from the Medical Advisory Committee for Prevention of Epidemic Diseases stated erroneously that, quote, inoculations had been made with a vaccine prepared from a culture obtained from a bone abscess of 14 years duration, end quote. Just thinking about that makes me cringe. The government bacteriologist in Wellington who produced the vaccine, however, got hold of this report. He was utterly indignant and wrote to the chief health officer in great dudgeon, demanding to know where the statement came from. The reply from the chief health, chief health officer was not included in the file and archives in New Zealand, so where the statement originated from, unfortunately, is not known, and I really want to know where it came from. I really do. These concerns over vaccine quality reach the highest levels of both military and civilian authority. Thomas Mackenzie, the High Commissioner in London, cabled the Prime Minister's office in Wellington in December 1915, calling into question the efficacy of the New Zealand-issued typhoid vaccine. Although stating that mortality had been, quote, more than double, end quote, it was in reality paratyphoid that Mackenzie was referring to. Less than 10% of the supposed enteric fever or typhoid-like cases were confirmed as actual typhoid. Vaccine quality concerns, however, continued to cause problems for the New Zealand military authorities throughout mu much of the war, certainly until, at least until early 1918. It was an ongoing, eventually they developed a polyvalent vaccine that dealt with typhoid, paratyphoid, A and B, and cholera in the one dose. In July 1916, the Honourable Mr James Allen, Minister for Defence, acknowledged to the House of Representatives that the government had no power to compel soldiers to undergo either vaccination or inoculation. The Military Service Act, which introduced conscription, was then being drafted, and Allen then proposed a late amendment aiming to prevent shirkers from using conscientious objection to vaccination and refusal to be vaccinated as a loophole to get out of conscripted service. The amendment was passed immediately without debate and became effective from 1 August 1916 as section 52.1 of the Military Service Act. It's quite a short section, there's only three subsections. And this is it, the really important bit. So the first part of the section states, Every member of the expeditionary force shall be guilty of an offence punishable as if it were an offence against section 18 of the Army Act who, whether within or beyond New Zealand, refuses to allow himself to be vaccinated or inoculated for the purpose of rendering him immune from any disease or fit for military service on being required so to do by any officer having military authority over him. It was official. You had to be vaccinated. And of course, in those days, women didn't go to war, so it was him and he. In September 1916, 
this, uh, one month later, the Solicitor General advised the Adjutant General that, quote, no surgical or dental operation can lawfully be performed upon a soldier without his consent. The only exception to this rule is the case of inoculation or va a vaccination or inoculation, end quote. As a qualification, this statement related to procedures that were not life-saving interventions or did not require a general anaesthetic or general anaesthesia. The 1916 legislation effectively removed the soldier's right to refuse vaccination through the conscientious objection clause of the Public Health Act in 1900. The law for compulsory vaccination for members of New Zealand's armed forces remains in effect as section 72.1 of the Armed Forces Discipline Act, 1971. The passing of section 52.1 of the Military Service Act, 1916, can be directly attributed to the mass refusal, vaccination refusal, by the men of the Ruapehu. It is a direct outcome of their refusal. By refusing the second round of injections en masse, the men drew attention of the military authorities to a loophole and the legality of compulsory vaccination for soldiers. Non-standardised terminology used by medical personnel created confusion, and while vaccination was accepted, inoculation was refused. Until the Military Service Act was passed, there was confusion even amongst the higher levels of the authorities over compulsion. Quality concerns as well as compulsion concerns um, with the vaccine remained an ongoing problem to the military until quite late in the war. So what does this mean for today? The legacy of the Ruapehu refuses continues to affect current serving personnel. The compulsion legislation of 101 years ago remains pretty much almost identically in effect today. The armed forces of New Zealand remain as far as I can ascertain, and I'm still trawling through the legislation, and but I haven't found anything yet, the only group within New Zealand where vaccination or inoculation is mandated by law with no right to refuse. Thank you. I hope you weren't too bored. Questions? Back. If you refuse vaccination, you have to leave the army. Yeah. It's the same in America. American army is the same. Um, if you refuse the anthrax vaccination, for example, um, you have no right to refuse it. You must leave the army. So, all the Marines, all the services. Can I get you to use the right for vaccination? I'm sorry? Nowadays, nowadays, do the military enforce their right to vaccinate their, yes. their soldiers? Yes, they do. Yes, they do. My co-supervisor is Professor Daryl Tong, and of course he's Lieutenant Colonel in Territorial Forces, and absolutely it is compulsory to be vaccinated, yes. So I know the, um, the aspect under consideration is the compulsory nature of it, but at what stage did the vaccination improve to the point where it wasn't laying people out for two days. Do you know that? Because that must no. have, must also impact on oh, uh, for sure. the Vacc decision making. I mean, this, bear in mind, this is 1914. Yeah. So vaccination um, manufacturing methods improved dramatically in, in the next 40 years. Um, it, it just got better and better. So I, I don't, can't answer your question. I don't know. I do know that 1920s there were issues with the diphtheria anti-toxin um, in Bundaberg in Queensland and certainly there have been other issues um, to the 1950s with contamination from uh, manufacturing methods and storage and handling but having said that vaccination today is light years, light years ahead of what they had then. I don't know at which point Typhoid, the typhoid and vaccination improved to the point where it's now just a jab. I don't even know if they get um, vaccinated against typhoid these days. I'm not sure. I would have to find that out. That's a good question. I'll find that one out. In 1956, I was drummed into the army and we had to line up on benches and have four jabs, one in the, each shoulder and one each arm. Mm. 
And one fellow, when the bench went down, because someone got up, he went down and he got it in the head. And the doctor said to the nurse, oh, shave his head and see if it took. <laughs> <laughs> Don't waste I'm it. Don't waste it. I'm interested in the, in the Australian Army because yes. they didn't have conscription. Do you know? No, they didn't. What, what happened there? Um, the Australian Army vaccination was initially voluntary. And then at some point, I'm not entirely sure, I haven't really looked at it, um, they, it became compulsory as well. But you're right, they had two referenda and both times conscription was um, refused. Right. So. Just another comment. Um, you might be interested to have a look at some of the transcriptions we've been doing of the World War I diaries. You're friends of the Hocken, aren't you? Yeah. yeah so you. particularly uh, Aiken, who was a medico in Egypt, uh, mentions that how he did a hundred vaccina vaccinations straight after tea and so forth. <laughs> oh. With the children being vaccinated, uh, there was a very high rate latterly amongst Maori children of hepatitis B. Mm. It wouldn't have been recognised as B, but it would have been recognised as hepatitis, I would guess. Was there any record of any increases in hepatitis B after rubbing wounds together? Oh, I'm sorry, I don't know. A part of the problem we've got too is that Māori records are not complete. They, they didn't track um, the Māori population terribly well. Many of the censuses don't actually include a Māori at all. So. I ha would have to do an awful lot of digging and it would take me far, far away to find that out. But that is very interesting. I don't know. Sorry. Yeah, Matt? Can I ask, what, what is your opinion of the MMR vaccine? Should it be compulsory? As we've seen, compulsory va vaccination didn't work 100 years ago. Do you think it would work again now? Other children at risk. But you have this now. It is unfortunate that um, the anti-vaccination movement of today, which is different to the anti-vaccination movement that happened in Britain and Europe at the time, um, has such sway. I, I, it's very disappointing for me. Um, that's my personal opinion. The anti there were three. There were three main anti-vaccination movements. The first was at the inception when people thought they were going to turn into cows and all sorts of things. And, and you, can, yeah, you can understand that. You know, it, it's a justifiable fear. Once it was proved that that actually didn't happen, it dropped off a bit. You still had your slightly eccentric people on the fringes who didn't believe in it and didn't work and all the rest of it. Then the compulsion aspect came in, and that's really when it got going. Once the conscientious objection clauses came in, it dropped right off. Anti-vaccinationism dropped right off. Again, you still had the odd, unusual person. Um, but what really happened, of course, is, in Amer and that was in Britain and Europe, but it was in America when you had the whole um, vaccination causes autism and in the 1980s that it's really taken off. And it's a totally different beast. It is t there's money involved in it because of the lawsuits. And it's a completely different kettle of fish now. Um, my very earliest, one of my very earliest memories is being horribly, horribly sick with measles. And I would love to see measles go the same way as smallpox because it is a terrible disease. People forget, think, oh, it's just some little childhood rash. It's a killer. It is a killer. You know, and I, I just, to this day, I hate the smell of calamine lotion. Yeah. Lee, do you, do you get a sense from the Otago Daily Times of the of that period, what the public perception around Dunedin was? Uh, was there sympathy for the refusers or? Yeah, there was. There was actually quite a degree of sympathy for the people who stood up for, them, for their principles. And I think there was a certain amount of, um, to use a colloquial phrase, sticking it to the man. Um, but there was certainly a certain amount of sympathy towards these, these men who had initially done what they thought was right, you know, the right thing. But because they just refused to have this inoculation and be aware they're calling it inoculation with all the attendant fears of live virus you know typhoid was a killer are you giving me live typhoid I'm going to die it was a fear it was a very genuine fear because the medical officers were calling it inoculation so I think there was a degree of sympathy yes 
Unfortunately, because 150 came back, including the incorrigibles, they all sort of got lumped in together. Because they were guilty of military, they were actually guilty of military misconduct, not following orders. What were the Germans doing at this time in, in relation to vaccination? Did they have trouble yep. with uh, refusers? I don't know, but I do know that they were certainly vaccinating like crazy for tetanus um, on the Western Front. Um, very early in the war, there was um, quite a, a peak in November of 1914 with tetanus cases in both the British and the German forces. Um, because the Western Front has been manured and ploughed and manured and ploughed for generations and generations and centuries, high degree of bacteria in that soil, so of, of um, tetanus bacteria in there. So they very quickly got on to, their troops got immunised, uh, got vaccinated, I mean, watch my terminology here, got vaccinated against tetanus certainly very early on. One interesting thought though is in Gallipoli, we never, they never had cholera. So they had bacillary and amoebic dysentery, they get gastritis and lots of other things, but they never actually had cholera, which was quite amazing, because I understand, I don't know for sure, but I would need to do some digging, that New Zealand troops were, had been well vaccinated against cholera well before they signed up, probably as children. Another question? Yeah. Just wait, wait one minute. We're recording this, so uh, we record the questions. <laughs> Thank you. You mentioned the penalties for not being vaccinated. How were these people discovered if they hadn't been vaccinated? Every six months, so the beginning in January and in July, the public vaccinator was sent a record through the births, deaths and marriages office of the births in his region. So that's how he tracked how many children, or which he could match up then, which children he had vaccinated against, which he hadn't, and then he went hunting for them. But that, that's after you appointed public vaccinators, but in the original act, there I was... I don't know. I'm sorry, I think it was left up to the doctors, actually. It was. Thank you. More question? Well, Lee, thank you very much for... A most enjoyable and a really very interesting talk. So well, thank you. would you all please join me in? Thank you. Thank you.